The Mystery of the Reluctant Storyteller, or The Case of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, written and introduced by Derek Wilson. The Mystery of the Reluctant Storyteller. Exactly 100 years ago, the most famous fictional detective of all time had his literary birth. It was in 1886 that an impecunious 27-year-old doctor whiled away the empty hours during which patients failed to call at his South Sea consulting rooms by writing A Study in Scarlet, the first ever Sherlock Holmes story. He'd already had some modest success with short stories sent to magazines in London and his native Edinburgh, but publishers were less than ecstatic about the new tale. Having received rejection slips from four or five of the more serious magazines, Arthur Conan Doyle came down market and offered it to Wardlock and Company, who specialised in cheap, sensational items. At the end of October, he received their reply. Dear sir, we have read your story and are pleased with it. We could not publish it this year, as the market is flooded at present with cheap fiction. But if you do not object to it being held over till next year, we will give you £25 for the copyright. Such was the inauspicious beginning of the Holmes-Watson partnership, which was to cover 41 years, and be recorded in 56 short stories and four novelettes, not to mention subsequent stage, film, radio and television appearances. The detective rapidly became a household name. Conan Doyle received in their thousands letters and parcels addressed to his famous creation, appeals for his help, requests for his autograph, even threats from the criminal underworld. On more than one occasion, the author had to protest to his readers that Sherlock Holmes was entirely imaginary. As early as 1891, he determined to bring the detective's career to an abrupt end. I think of slaying Holmes in story number six and winding him up for good and all. He takes my mind from better things, he wrote in a letter to his mother. The dramatic death of Holmes with his great rival, Professor Moriarty, in the Reichenbach Falls, and his return to life in The Adventure of the Empty House are well known. Conan Doyle made two further attempts to bring the Holmes canon to an end, but it was no use. For the adoring public, Holmes and Watson were real people, and Conan Doyle simply had no right to murder them in cold blood. Let the truth be told, the occupants of 221B Baker Street had taken on a separate identity, even for their author. They were like business partners in an enterprise that was tedious to maintain, yet too lucrative to wind up. And they were not very congenial colleagues. I am weary of Holmes because his character admits of no light or shade. He is a calculating machine. As for Watson, in the course of seven volumes, he never shows one gleam of humour or makes one single joke. Harsh words for two men whose exploits made Conan Doyle extremely prosperous and earned more money than the serious historical and scientific fiction that he considered much more important. Now, what would happen if the roles were reversed? Supposing that among Dr. Watson's voluminous case notes we were to discover an investigation, not into some bizarre crime, but into the no less intriguing character and career of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself. Sherlock Holmes lay motionless upon the sofa. Beside him on the floor, jottings for a definitive monograph on watermarks in notepaper rested where they had fallen from his listless fingers. For three hours, my friend had reclined limply, the only movement of his features being the occasional flicker of his eyes towards the mantelpiece, upon which stood the cocaine bottle and the leather case which held his hypodermic syringe. I was all too familiar with the symptoms which fell upon my companion whenever there was a lull in his remarkable career. It was my self-imposed task at such times to find some means of distracting him from the drug whose temporary stimulus could only be attended by the most appalling long-term effects. It was therefore I who broke the long silence, laying aside the newspaper that I had made a pretense of reading. Holmes! I have been thinking. I congratulate you, Watson. It is an activity I've been urging upon you for several years. I ignored the barb. Yes, well, that is the very point. You know, I yield place to no man in my admiration of your mental prowess. In all the years of our friendship, I have never ceased to be amazed by the keenness of your observation and your power of deduction. Holmes waved his hand in a deprecatory gesture, but I could see that he was not displeased with my remarks. A raised eyebrow and the suggestion of a smile upon his thin lips signalled his invitation to proceed with my train of thought. i would never thought it possible that a finer mind could exist, yet now I realise that I've been wrong. You refer, of course, to Mycroft. I told you myself that he is the best. Uh, no, Holmes, I was not alluding to your brother. My dear Watson, as you know, I am neither modest nor vain. 
Therefore, when I say that you are mistaken, that is a matter of pure fact. Apart from Mycroft, the man does not exist who is my superior in the science of applied observation. If he did, it is inconceivable that I would not have heard of him. You do not wish me, then, to name my candidate? Make your case, by all means, if you have no objection to my pointing out the flaws in its logic. Why, then, the man to whom I allude is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> Our esteemed creator. What a very droll idea. Surely, Holmes, you must allow that the mind which conceived the elaborate plots of your cases and the tortuous processes of deduction by which they were solved is a greater than your own. Really, Watson, your own good sense should indicate the fallacy in such an argument. Consider, if you will, which is easier, to devise a crime, invent a perpetrator of that crime and then lay a trail of obscure clues for the detective to follow, or to be that detective who, pursuing the meagrest of evidence, must grope as in a darkened room, successfully trace effects back to causes and arrive at the correct solution by pure deductive logic. Hmm. Then you have little regard for Sir Arthur. On the contrary. From the many indications in the chronicles of our adventures, it is possible to deduce that the author is a very remarkable man. It was merely your comparing his mental capacity to my own, to which I took exception. You think it possible to tell a man's character from his written works? If they are extensive enough. For example... I fancy one could assemble a tolerably complete biography of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle from the 60 cases of mine that he presented to the public. Oh, come, Holmes. That surely is going a bit far. And my friend bestirred himself, and I expected to see him take down his accursed drug bottle and syringe. However, it was for his old briar root pipe and the Persian slipper containing his tobacco that his hand reached out. Only after he had filled the bowl, lit it, drawn upon it, and exhaled a long stream of blue-gray smoke, did he offer an explanation of his extraordinary remark? Arthur Conan Doyle was a sometime medical practitioner of an Irish family long domiciled on this side of the water, a man of energetic and sometimes passionate disposition, a literary snob, a keen sportsman, though not well acquainted with the turf, widely travelled but a deep patriot, as travellers usually are. He was untidy in his personal habits, impatient in his dealings with other people, though courteous to women to an almost absurd degree. His mother was the dominating influence in his life, his father being a pitiable alcoholic. In his early years, he had the misfortune to fall into the hands of a paranoid bully who inflicted indignity and injustice upon him. He resided for most of his life in London and the South East. He smoked clay pipes and he kept scrapbook. Holmes, that is remarkable. I have seen you make astonishingly accurate deductions about people you have met. But how in the name of all that's wonderful did you arrive at these conclusions about a man upon whom you have never set eyes? Simplicity itself, my dear fellow. Doyle is the name of an ancient Irish family, yet Sir Arthur makes no reference to Ireland in his writings. It is therefore clear that direct contact with the land of his ancestors ceased long before he was born. He chose a doctor as the mouthpiece for my adventures and possessed a medical knowledge beyond anything which could have been acquired casually. Ergo, he trained and practiced as a physician before devoting himself to writing. The chronicle of my exploits occupied his pen intermittently from 1886 to 1927. It is reasonable to assume that the Sherlock Holmes stories were popular and profitable, yet he tried to destroy me in the Reichenbach Falls in 1894, and on two subsequent occasions informed his audience that they had seen the last of me. Now, why does an author abandon his most successful creation? Oh, I suppose because he could not think of any more plots. A plausible hypothesis, Watson, but disproved surely by the 60 inventive and original cases we have been privileged to share together. Now, the simple truth is that Doyle came to regard the popular detective story as beneath him. His literary pretensions persuaded him that he was cut out for better things. Therefore, I say, he was a snob. Well, in his autobiography... What? He... You've been reading his autobiography? Really, Watson, I cannot too strongly try to dissuade you from such pastimes. You should never take a man at his own valuation. I never read autobiographies. I was about to remark that in his autobiography, Sir Arthur, in part, bears you out. I went into my room and returned directly with a volume in question, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Memories and Adventures, which I had indeed been recently reading with great interest. I soon found the reference I was looking for. Yes, here we are, said I. He writes, the real romance of the family lies in the fact... ...lies in the fact that about the middle of the 17th century, the Reverend Richard Pack married Mary Percy, heir to the Irish branch of the Percys of Northumberland. 
By this alliance, we all connect up with that illustrious lineup to three separate marriages with the Plantagenets. One has, therefore, some strange strains in one's blood, which are noble in origin, and one can but hope, are noble in tendency. How absurd this obsession with ancestry is. You will recall several occasions on which we have encountered men whose conduct has been as repugnant as their lineage has been noble. Lord St. Simon in The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor. The insufferable pride of the Duke of Holderness, which endangered the life of his young son in the Priory School case. And that appalling blackguard, Dr. Grimesby Roylott, whose obsession with maintaining his ancient station in the county drove him to murder in the affair of the Speckled Band. Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood. Quite so. We have, then, a man conscious of his ancestry on both sides of the family. That consciousness was doubtless fostered by his mother, descended as she was from the Percy's. I see her taking the young Arthur upon her knee and filling his head with tales of ancient chivalry and valiant deeds. Why, yes, he writes as much here. He says that he loved to hear the tales his mother told. At an early age, he graduated to the novels of Sir Walter Scott and other writers of historical romance. At school, apparently, he became quite a storyteller himself, keeping the boys in his dormitory entranced with yarns of adventure and chivalry. One could deduce as much from the compendium you have compiled of my cases. How often has historical romance thrust its unwelcome visage upon the scene of pure scientific detection? You recall, of course, the Cavaliers and Roundhead saga of the Musgrave ritual, the use made of family legend in The Hound of the Baskervilles, the mystique of ancient brotherhoods, as in The Five Orange Pips, and the frequent settings of crimes in rambling country mansions peopled by men and women of quality. It is obvious that young Arthur was not only a dreamer, but a sadly deprived child. It may be obvious to you, Holmes, but for the life of me, I cannot see the connection. Really? Surely it is plain enough. Most little boys escape from the boredom of school and home by reading adventure yarns. But for this boy, it became an obsession. Why did he retreat so often into a world of castles and manor houses, peopled by knights, ladies and noblemen with all the trappings of privilege? And why did his mother encourage him? Obviously, she found herself in a station in life far below that which she believed was her due. Scarcely surprising, then, that her son should have come both to envy and despise his social superiors. There is certainly a passage here which bears out your theory. Sir Arthur is describing his upbringing as the eldest of seven siblings in one of the humbler quarters of Edinburgh. He lived in a cul-de-sac street with a very vivid life of its own and a fierce feud between the small boys who dwelt on either side of it. Now, finally, it was fought out between two champions, I representing the poor boys who lived in flats and my opponent, the richer boys who lived in the opposite villas. We fought in the garden of one of the said villas and had an excellent contest of many rounds, not being strong enough to weaken each other. When I got home after the battle, my mother cried, Oh, Arthur, what a dreadful eye you have got. To which I replied, You just go across and look at Eddie Tullock's eye. Aha! There, I fancy, we see the originals of our own Baker Street Irregulars. What does your book tell us of the father of this Edinburgh backstreet urchin? Surprisingly little, Holmes. He appears to have been an amateur painter, descended, it seems, from a line of very accomplished artists. Sir Arthur seems convinced that he could have earned a living with this brush, but that all too often he gave his pictures away. He earned his bread and butter as a junior civil servant. At the age of nine, Arthur was sent away to school, and for the next eight years he was only at home for a few weeks in the summer. Capital! A mother in straitened financial circumstances yet makes the sacrifice to place her eldest son as a boarder in an academy where he's not only looked after during term time, but also during the Christmas and Easter holidays. Obviously, it was her only way of protecting him from the influence of a drunken father. The writer here says nothing to suggest the existence of a debauched parent. And it is what he does not say that is most significant. The boy felt in every fibre of his being the shame of his father's addiction. Even in later years, he could not bring himself to write about it. That seems a rather unlikely conclusion to draw from an author's silence. Indeed it is, Watson. But you know what I have always insisted, and proved in so many of my cases. When we have eliminated the impossible, what remains, however improbable... Must be the truth. Precisely. But in this instance, we have corroborative evidence in the shape of Conan Doyle's almost pathological obsession with alcoholism. Holmes sprang from the sofa, his body all energy now that his mind was rising to the problem. He seized from a shelf the volumes in which our cases are recorded, flung one across to me, and spreading the others out upon the table, began feverishly turning the pages. 
find the Abbey Grange affair, Watson. How do you find Sir Eustace Brackenstall described? Abbey Grange. Ah, yes, here we are. Eustace Brackenstall. Ah, this is it, I think. Inspector Hopkins says he was a good-hearted man when he was sober, but a perfect fiend when he was drunk. Or rather, when he was half drunk, for he seldom really went the whole way. The devil seemed to be in him at such times, and he was capable of anything. I remember the case well, Holmes. His poor wife was cruelly abused by her drunken brute of a husband. And here is the description of Peter Carey. Black Peter, as you extravagantly called him. The man was an intermittent drunkard. And when he had the fit on him, he was a perfect fiend. He had been known to drive his wife and daughter out of doors in the middle of the night and flog them through the park until the whole village outside the park was aroused by their screams. Note that it is always women who suffered most at the hands of these inebriated villains. You will, of course, remember the vile Enoch Drebber. Why, yes. That was the first case in which I accompanied you, a study in Scarlet. So long ago, yet the memory's as clear as if it happened yesterday. Drebber tried to force his attention upon his landlady's daughter. The mother told us what happened. Yes, here it is. Mr. Drebber returned much excited and evident of the worst for drink. He forced his way into the room where I was sitting with my daughter. He turned to Alice and before my very face proposed to her that she should fly with him. You are of age, he said, and there is no law to stop you. I have money enough and to spare. Never mind the old girl here, but come along with me now. The unspeakable bounder. If ever a man merited a violent end, it was Enoch Drebber. Just so, Watson. But think, Drebber, Carey, Brackenstall and others, they all draw their inspiration from one and the same source. A man whose weakness for drink and the misery it inflicted on a brave woman made such an indelible impression on a young man's mind that he reappeared in story after story. Before I could take up the matter, uh, Mrs. Hudson came in with a tea tray. Holmes scarcely touched the food. He spent three quarters of an hour searching through directories and files of newspaper cuttings, making a series of notes, and then rushed out, saying that he had some telegraphs to send. I was delighted to see him revived from his lethargy and thought little more about the subject of our recent discussion. Over the next two days, a series of telegraphs was delivered, which Holmes tore open with impatience. Most of them he crumpled up and tossed aside with a gesture of annoyance, but some he stuffed into his pockets. On the third morning, I was roused suddenly from a deep sleep, and looking up, found my friend standing beside the bed. Come, Watson. Breakfast awaits and we must catch the ten o'clock from Paddington. You'll need to pack for three or four days. Uh, to my mild and semi-incoherent protest, he replied, My dear fellow, don't look so hard done by. It was you who started this particular hair to divert me from the drug of which you so strongly disapprove. You must now stay with me to the kill. He ventured no explanation until we were settled in the corner seats of a great Western Railway smoker with tickets for Plymouth in our pockets. Well, Watson, uh, here we are on the trail of Dr. Grimes B. Roylott. You remember, of course, our dramatic first encounter with that tempestuous fiend. I certainly did remember how the villain of Holmes' case of the speckled band had burst in upon us at 221B Baker Street. Without a warning knock, the door of our rooms was dashed open. Which of you was Holmes? The speaker was a huge man. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural, having a black top hat, a long frock coat, and a pair of high gaiters with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to span it across from side to side. A large face seared with a thousand wrinkles, burnt yellow with the sun, and marked with every evil passion, was turned from one to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and his high, thin, fleshless nose and gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. Holmes is my name, sir. But you have the advantage of me. I am Dr. Grimesby Rowlott of Stoke Moran. Indeed. Doctor, pray take a seat. I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I have traced her. What has she been saying to you? It is a little cold for the time of year. What has she been saying to you? But I have heard that the crocuses promise well. <laughs> so you put me off, do you? I know you, you scoundrel. I've heard of you before. You are Holmes the meddler. Our unwanted guest took a step forward, brandishing his crop. Holmes the busybody. Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. Your conversation is most entertaining. When you go out, close the door, for there is a decided draft. I will go when I have said my say. Don't you dare to meddle with my affairs. 
I know that Miss Stoner has been here. I traced her. I am a dangerous man to fall foul of. See here. He stepped swiftly forward, seized the poker, and bent it into a curve with his huge brown hand. <clears throat> See that you keep yourself out of my grip. He hurled a twisted poker into the fireplace and strode from the room, not troubling to close the door behind him. Oh, yes, Holmes. I remember Dr. Grimesby Royal at well. But I don't see what he has to do with our visit to Plymouth. You will doubtless recall from your autobiographical reading that Conan Doyle graduated in medicine from Edinburgh University in 1881 and that he set up a practice in South Sea in 1882. I may say that I prefer to establish my facts with the aid of the medical register. South Sea, however, was his second practice. For a few months preceding his move, he was in partnership at Plymouth with an old college friend, Dr. George Budd. I recall something of the sort. They fell out and parted company. During that brief spell in Plymouth, Budd made an impact on his colleague which was to have consequences almost as lasting as those of his father's drunkenness. Uh, just a minute, Holmes. You haven't proved that his father was a drunkard. A frown of impatience crossed his face. Oh, that was simplicity itself. I telegraphed all the hospitals and mental institutions in and around Edinburgh. I confess, I drew a blank at first, but so convinced was I of the truth of my deductions that I ranged farther afield with my inquiries. At last, my researches bore fruit. Charles Altamont Doyle was committed to Montrose Royal Lunatic Asylum in May 1885, suffering from alcoholism and epilepsy. He died there eight years later. What a terrible business. Yes, yes. Yes, and before it reached its sad conclusion, the young doctor with a career to make and no resources save the letters after his name becomes involved with the unstable George Budd. Who you think was the model for Roylott? Of Roylott and a succession of other bullies with whom we have had to deal over the years. The odious Rucastle of the Copper Beaches, whose demeanour was as amiable as his mind was warped with avarice and cruelty. Blessington, the resident patient who took advantage of an impecunious young doctor to shield himself from the vengeance of his erstwhile criminal confederates. Your own recollections will furnish other candidates. Over the next few days, we made inquiries about Dr. Budd among members of the Plymouth medical profession and patients who remembered him. And a more eccentric, quick-tempered, tempestuous fellow it would be hard to imagine. Budd was obviously the sort of man whom once met can never be forgotten. Anyone unfortunate enough to become involved professionally with him, as poor Doyle did, ran the risk of being irretrievably ruined. One of our informants described Conan Doyle's arrival at the Plymouth practice. Having invited his old friend to join him in what he described as a highly lucrative partnership, he met Doyle at the station and conveyed him by carriage to his business premises. The newcomer was astonished to observe a large sign reading, Dr. Budd, free consultation, and to find the house overflowing with patients. A servant ran out to open the carriage door. <coughs> How many here, boy? 140? Good. All the waiting room from school? Good. And the courtyard full? Good. Stable full? Excellent. Coach house full? Ah, still room in the coach house, is there? Mm, I'm sorry, uh... I'm sorry we haven't got a crowded day for you, Doyle. Of course, we can't command these things. We must take them as they come. Come in, now in it again, where can't you? Come here and see the waiting room. Oh, what an atmosphere. Eh, can't you open the windows for yourselves? I never saw such folk. There are 30 people in this room, Doyle, and not one with the sense enough to open a window to save himself from the suffocation. I tried to open the screw to the side. Ah, my man, you'll never get on in the world if you can't open the window without raising a sash. Give me your umbrella. Yeah, that's the way. Boy, see the screw is taken out. Now then, Doyle, come along, we'll get to work. This is my consultant. There are one or two elementary rules to be observed in the way of handling patients. The most obvious is that you must never let them see that you want them. It should be pure condescension on your part, seeing them at all. And the more difficult that you, you can throw in the way of it, the more they think of it. Break your patients in early and keep them well to heal. Never make the fatal mistake of being polite to them. Watch this. Stop your confounded jabbering down there. I might as well be living on a poultry show. 
see? They'll think ever so much more of me for that. But don't they get offended? Not in the slightest. They come to expect it. An offended patient is the finest advertisement in the world. It stimulates curiosity. I often come in every morning and send them all about their business, telling them I'm going off to the country for a day. I turn away 40 pounds and it's worth 400 as an advertisement. But I understood from the notice outside that the consultations were gratis. Oh, so they are, so they are. <laughs> but they have to pay for the medicine. And if a patient wishes to come out of turn, he has to pay half a guinea for the privilege. There are generally about 20 every day who would rather pay than wait several hours. All right, boy, let the rabble in. Good morning, Doctor. Mm -hmm. What are you here for? Well, Doctor, I've been getting very short of breath lately. Now then, Doyle, what's your diagnosis? Well, I should have to examine the There's patient. There's no need to examine. It's as plain as a pike staff. She drinks too much tea. You've been drinking too much tea, do you hear? Oh, oh, well, yes. Perhaps, if you say so, Doctor. I do say so. Doyle, uh, hand me down that copy of Taylor's <laughs> Medical Jurisprudence. Thank you. Now, you, put your hand on this book and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God... ...that for 14 days I'll drink nothing but cocoa. Uh, for 14 days I'll drink nothing but cocoa. Right. Now, take this prescription to the dispensary. Next! Such unprofessional conduct shocked Doyle. But he was a young, inexperienced doctor, and there was no doubt that the practice was highly profitable. He settled down as junior partner, but Bud was an unpredictable colleague, and their partnership was marred by frequent arguments. After some months, Doyle was abruptly asked to leave without any real reason being given. By way of compensation, Bud would make regular payments to Doyle until the latter was established in his own practice. Doyle moved to Portsmouth and put up his plate. Within days of his new start, he received a letter from Bud. When the maid was arranging your room after your departure, she cleared some pieces of torn paper from under the grate. Seeing my name upon them, she brought them, as in duty bound, to her mistress, who pasted them together and found that they formed a letter from your mother to you, in which I am referred to in the vilest terms, such as a bankrupt swindler and the unscrupulous Bud. I can only say that we are astonished that you could have been a party to such a correspondence while you were a guest under our roof, and we refuse to have anything more to do with you in any shape or form. Doyle knew then, if he had not realized it before, that George Budd was a liar and a cheat. His mother certainly disapproved of Budd, and had written describing the eccentric doctor in those very words. But that letter was still in Doyle's possession and had never lain in fragments in the fireplace at Plymouth. It was clear that the obsessive Bud had been secretly reading Doyle's correspondence and was now using the pretext of a supposed insult to ruin the young doctor. I agree, Holmes, I said to my friend when we had returned from Devon and were back in our rooms. Such an episode would leave an indelible mark upon the mind of a struggling young doctor. Yes. Among his other eccentricities, Bud was also given to picking fist fights. On at least one occasion, he blooded Doyle's nose. The doctor turned author could only revenge himself through his writings. Do you recall my chastening of the wretched woman molester Woodley? In the adventure of the solitary cyclist. Yes, you arrived back here with a cut lip and some nasty bruises. Now, Watson, whom do you suppose Doyle was vicariously trouncing in that encounter? You're right, of course. Doyle says in his autobiography that he put Bud out of his mind forever after the Plymouth episode. But he wouldn't have been human if he'd not brooded upon his treatment at the hands of such an extraordinary character. Quite so, Watson. A writer, after all, cannot create characters out of thin air. He must take his materials from real life. Hmm. Where, then, did the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes come from? Oh, no mystery there. Cast your mind back to our first meeting. Where did it take place? Ah, in the chemical laboratory at Bart's Hospital. Young Stanford took me there to introduce us. You were working alone in the lofty room. As you heard us approach, you sprang up and rushed towards us with a test tube in your hand. Oh, I found it. I have found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And how are you? You've been in Afghanistan, I perceive. Uh, 
How on earth did you know that? <laughs> Never mind. The question now is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. It is interesting, chemically, no doubt, but, but practically... My man, it is the most practical medico-legal discovery for years. Don't you see that it gives us an infallible test for blood stains? Come over here now. Now, if I prick my finger and extract some blood, like so, and add this drop to a litre of water, you perceive that the resulting mixture has the appearance of pure water. The proportion of blood cannot be more than one in a million. I have no doubt, however, that we shall be able to obtain the characteristic reaction. Some of these crystals and a drop of this fluid, and voila, immediately we have a brownish deposit. There. What do you think of that? It seems to be a very delicate test. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. The old Guiacum test was very clumsy and uncertain. So is the microscopic examination for blood corpuscles. The latter is valueless if the stains are a few hours old. Now, this appears to act as well whether the blood is old or new. Had this test been invented, there are hundreds of men now walking the earth who would long ago have paid the penalty of their crimes. Indeed. Criminal cases are continually hinging upon that one point. A man is suspected of a crime months, perhaps, after it has been committed. His linen or clothes are examined and brownish stains discovered upon them. Are they blood stains? Or mud stains? Or rust stains? Or fruit stains? Or what are they? That is a question which has puzzled many an expert. And why? Because there was no reliable test. Now we have the Sherlock Holmes test. There will no longer be any difficulty. I shall certainly never forget that meeting. But the circumstances, ma'am, the circumstances. What did they suggest to you? You mean meeting in a chemical laboratory? Precisely. Here is a young man making his first foray into detective fiction. Does he introduce his hero in an office at Scotland Yard? No. He chooses a laboratory. Why? Because that is the setting in which he is familiar with the man upon whom he based his new creation. There was, at Edinburgh University, while Conan Doyle was studying, an excellent surgeon by the name of Dr. Joseph Bell. He was a brilliant diagnostician, and Doyle was one of his favourite students. Bell certainly considered himself to be my prototype. I have here a copy of the Pall Mall Gazette, containing an interview he gave some years ago. You may find the extract I have marked of interest. Ah, yes. <laughs> I, I recollect Doyle was amused once when a patient walked in and sat down. Good morning, Pat, I said, for it was impossible not to see that he was an Irishman. Oh, good morning, Your Honor, replied the patient. Uh, did you enjoy your walk across the links today as you came in from the south side of the town, I asked. Oh, yes, said Pat. Did Your Honor see me? Well, Conan Doyle was amazed uh, at how I knew that, absurdly simple though it was. On a showery day such as that had been, the reddish clay at bare parts of the links adheres to the boot, and a tiny part is bound to remain. Uh, there is no such clay anywhere else around the town for miles. Of course, Doyle built on this basis, but we need look no further for his basic inspiration. Well, Holmes, I believe I can prove you wrong there. I've been carrying out some investigations of my own and discovered something which shows Doyle in a favourable light as a detective. Yesterday, I spent the afternoon at the offices of the Daily Telegraph and transcribed some articles on a case in which Doyle was directly involved. I have my notes here. May I read them to you? By all means. Some years ago, there lived in the vicarage of Great Wyley near Birmingham a clergyman by the name of the Reverend Chapurji Idalji, an Indian gentleman married to an Englishwoman. He had served his parishioners faithfully for several years and was generally respected. However, there were those who harboured prejudice and hatred against Mr. Adalji, and he and his family were subjected to a long persecution by anonymous letters. Then, there occurred a savage outbreak of animal killings in the area. The cattle, horses and sheep were viciously done to death by a maniac with a knife. The police, for no very adequate reason, believed that the vicar's eldest son, George Adalji, a practising solicitor, was guilty of both crimes. The astounding fact is that with hardly any evidence, they managed to obtain a conviction against the unfortunate young man. To some police officers, convictions will always be more important than justice, Watson, but pray continue. The wretched Idalji had not served half his sentence when, without any word of explanation, he was released. No pardon? No. Someone in authority is suffering a belated twinge of conscience. Indeed. By then, of course, Idalji was professionally ruined. Fortunately, it was at this point that Doyle interested himself in the case. He arranged to meet the young lawyer in the foyer of the Charing Cross Hotel. I take up his own account of the meeting. 
I had been delayed, and Adalji was already there, passing the time by reading the paper. I recognized my man by his dark face, so I stood and observed him. He held the paper close to his eyes and rather sideways. I crossed the foyer and extended my hand. You're Mr. Adalji. My name is Conan Doyle. Ah. Uh, don't you suffer from astigmatic myopia? The astigmatism is marked, and I think there's a very high degree of myopia. Don't you wear glasses? I never have, Sir Arthur. I've gone to two ophthalmic surgeons, and they can't fit me with glasses that are any use. They but say... But surely this point was raised at your trial. Sir Arthur, I wanted to call an optician as a witness. You can verify that. But my legal advisor said the evidence against me was so palpably ridiculous that they wouldn't trouble. The idea of this man, half blind in daylight, groping his way around the countryside at night in order to catch animals and do them to death was patently absurd. Doyle wrote the first of his articles about the case. And one result was that he began to receive disgusting letters from the real criminal. Excellent. That must have given him the opportunity to compare handwriting. Uh, yes, well, of course. That is exactly what he did. There was a seven-year gap between the writing of the two sets of letters. He says, I contend that the anonymous letters of the first period were the work of two persons. One, a decently educated man, the other, a foul-mouthed, semi-literate boy. I contend that the later letters were nearly all written by that same foul-mouthed boy, then grown into a man in his twenties. On further evidence, I contend that Foulmouth not only wrote the letters, but did the mutilations. Then I addressed myself to the question of why there should be such a long interval between the two sets of letters. To me, this did not suggest that the culprit had changed his whole character and habits overnight, reverting to them with equal malice later. It suggested absence, that someone had been away during that time. Then the case solves itself. Oh, really, Holmes, you might let Doyle finish the story in his own way. But, my dear fellow, I see from the pages of manuscript in your hand that he's going to take hours over it, since the solution is obvious. Uh, have you seen that letter from Count Chernyinsky that arrived this morning? I was reading it by the window earlier. On the chair, underneath your violin. What do you mean, obvious? Ah, yes. Thank you, Watson. This problem of the Counts really looks most promising. I'm oh, sorry, uh, what did you say? Oh, the anonymous letters. Obviously, the search narrows itself to two young men, probably brothers with a grudge against the Adalgis. One of them has worked closely with animals, perhaps in a butcher's or a slaughterhouse, and has spent seven years in prison or at sea. Given such evidence as that, I fancy that even Inspector Lestrade could scarcely fail to apprehend the culprits. Now, let me read to you what Count Chernyinsky said. The next ten days were entirely devoted to the search for the Count's abducted heir. A search which ended tragically in a recently dug drainage ditch at Clapham. The subsequent interview with the distraught nobleman and his English wife, who was prostrate with grief, affected Holmes more than he would admit. He blamed himself for not having realized sooner the significance of the engraved paper knife, and believed that had he done so, he might have saved the child's life. At the conclusion of the case, he lapsed once more into an inert melancholy. At last, on a fine spring morning, I persuaded him to take a brisk constitutional with me along Oxford Street. As we walked, I turned his attention again to what I had already labelled in my mind the mystery of the reluctant storyteller. Holmes, about this Conan Doyle fellow. Yes, Watson? You were quite right in most of your deductions about him, but there are still a few points unexplained in your assessment of his character. Well, Watson, let us settle the matter quickly and have done with it, for I am bored with the man. How could you deduce his patriotism? Even in these egalitarian times, one is not awarded a knighthood for writing detective fiction. In the case which you dubbed The Adventure of the Three Garridebs, a passing reference is made to my having refused the knighthood in 1902 for services not unconnected with the recent South African War. I have the distinct impression that he credited me with the indelicacy he lacked himself. Doyle was the man honoured for services to his country during the Boer War. Having a dislike of empty titles, he would have liked to decline the honour. He did the next best thing. I think I see how you deduce his domicile in London and the home counties. Most of our adventures occurred in the capital or within a hundred miles radius of it. When he finally quitted his practice for a literary career, he moved here. 
And perhaps at a house in the country as well. Exactly. Yet many references to continental locations and to the United States of America, for which he had a particular attraction, show him to have been a much-traveled man. You remarked that he was untidy. I should have thought that the neat details of his detective narratives refute that. <laughs> My dear Watson, you above all people should be aware of a certain carelessness in Doyle's writing. At the conclusion of The Sign of Four, you go off happily to marry your Mary, leaving me in bachelor seclusion at Baker Street. In subsequent adventures, we catch a few glimpses of your domestic bliss with Mary, who, incidentally, in the case of the man with the twisted lip, insists on calling you James when it has already been established that your first name is John. Then you are abruptly widowed without ceremony or explanation, for the adventure of the empty house finds you living a solitary life in Kensington, and within weeks you are back in 221B. Yes. <laughs> I certainly regarded myself rather ill-used at the time. Doyle is an impatient writer, ever eager to get on with his story. His work bristles with inaccuracies. You recall my comment that he is ignorant of the technicalities of horse racing. In Silver Blaze, he situates two training stables for flat racing in the middle of Dartmoor, an extremely hilly region and far from the principal race courses. The security arrangements at King's Pyland were lamentable and would certainly have attracted the attention of the Jockeys Club long before the murder which attracted me to the place. We walked for some minutes in silence, Holmes doubtless pondering deeply some abstruse problem of forensic chemistry, and I brooding upon his opinion of Conan Doyle. At last, I broached the subject again. Do you not think, Holmes, that you're being somewhat hard on Sir Arthur? Not at all. I am deducing facts, and facts are neither hard nor soft. It may be that the drift of your questions has caused me to concentrate on certain rather negative aspects of the man's character. If it will satisfy you, I will point to certain compensating features. These include an insatiable appetite for adventure, which took him to sea and on military campaigns, a facility with firearms, a passionate sense of justice, a stubborn loyalty to his friends, a generosity which often went beyond the bounds of reason, and a keen, if unorthodox, religious sense. Holmes, that is amazing. How? No, my dear friend, no more. Arthur Conan Doyle is, like us, an immortal enigma. Let him remain so. And not another word did Sherlock Holmes ever utter upon the subject. The mystery of the reluctant storyteller was written and introduced by Derek Wilson, with Mark Wing Davy as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Hilton as Dr. Watson. Others in the cast, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Bruce Douglas, Dr. Budd and George Adalji, Edward D'Souza, Dr. Roylott, Esmond Rideout and the old lady, Sybil Eubank. Production from Bristol by Brian Miller.